Good morning, church. Glad to be with you today to bring a word. Michael asked me several weeks ago if I would fill in while he was away on this weekend of spiritual retreat. And I said, is there a certain sermon series? Is there a theme that they'll be wanting to hear on that day? And he said, well, we're just following the lectionary. So I went off and read the lectionary scriptures and landed on the gospel lesson. And I thought, that's a lesson on humility. Who better to preach on humility than me? That might be a little too much laughter for that joke. <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, but I, I have it on good authority from a friend who is a Canadian Mennonite. Is he around the corner? <laughs> that as a Canadian Mennonite, they are most proud of their humility. So, you know, I, I mentioned this to a friend or two, and people are nodding along, and then I think I just made one mention too many, because an older friend of mine looked at me and said, I think you got some reading up to do. So, I've done some reading up, <laughs> I've got a sermon, and what I want to do today is to look at this scripture and ask the question, what did Jesus mean when he told this story, and what does this story mean to us today? What difference does it make if we are humble as individuals and as a congregation? What does it look like in Decatur in these days if we take this scripture to heart? You ready to do that? Great. Let's pray together. God, we come to you with grateful hearts, thankful for this time together, thankful for your word that lives and breathes even today. We know there is a lesson in here, O oh God, for each one of us. So open our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh this day. We are ready to be changed by you, by your word, and by your love. Gratefully we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's look at scripture. This story that Jesus tells is really different from a lot of the other parables and stories that he puts out there in his teaching. And what he does, look at verse 9. He is saying, this is why I'm telling you this. Here's the audience I'm speaking to. Now, I am a lover of the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, and I will occasionally foray into the Message Bible because I think it gives uh, plainer language and some fresh insights. So I want to read verse 9 from the Message. He told this next story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down their noses at the common people. And I'm sure Jesus paused, you know, and said, you know who you are, right? And then he went on and he told the story, and this is what it says in the message. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax man. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this, oh God, I thank you, I am not like those other people. Robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid, like this tax man. I fast twice a week, I tithe all my income. Meanwhile, the tax man slumped in the shadows, his face in his hands, not daring to look up, said, God, give mercy. Forgive me, a sinner. Jesus commented, this tax man, not the other, went home, made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. So what's the state of mind, the state of heart in each one of these characters in the story? This Pharisee, as Jesus portrays him, he held to the law, to all the religious rules, he followed them to the letter, he checked all the boxes, he did all the right things, for all the wrong reasons. He was doing them by himself, for himself, making his way into what's next. 
It was all about him. It wasn't about God. And then we have the contrast in the tax collector. He knew he was a sinner. His job was held in very low esteem, and he could very easily wrong people financially. He knew that he needed God's mercy and that he couldn't earn it by doing certain things. He humbled himself before God, bowing his head, asking for forgiveness. So we get to the title of the sermon. Who do you think you are? Which character in this story do you identify with? Show of hands? Maybe not. <laughs> Unless the option is, how many say, no thank you, right? <laughs> I don't want to pick. I'd like to say nothing, right? Because one is an elitist and the other is a sinner, an outcast. But who does Jesus want us to identify with? It's very clear in verse 14. It's the tax collector. Be humble, be yourself, acknowledge your sin, and confess your need for God's grace. Jesus is saying to us, your churchy ways do not justify your existence. You do not get your ticket to heaven punched by those things that you are doing. It's about being humble before God and humble in your relationships with other people. And there are many, many other scriptures that talk to us about being humble. In my work as a regional staff person, I go to many churches and do elders retreats. One of the scriptures that I like to use in that retreat is 1 Peter 5, it's 1 through 11. And it talks about the qualities and characteristics of an elder. And 1 Peter 5, 5 says this, in the same way you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. All of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And in Colossians 3.12, we read, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I think it's interesting in both of these scriptures that it talks about putting on humility, like we put on clothing. I think that's saying to us very clearly that humility is not naturally a part of who we are. It's not part of our human nature, but is a part of our spiritual nature, part of being created in the image of God. And as Hannah said, humility is an attitude. It's a response that we learn. It is grounded in our faith. It's something that we choose every day and several times a day. And I'm afraid there are times when we let our pride go neglected and run rampant in our lives. We let selfishness, our ego, become the center of our universe rather than putting God at the center that we consider more important our own needs and our own desires, our own status over the needs of other people. Richard Rohr, a Catholic priest, wonderful spiritual writer, I read meditations by him on a daily basis. I probably have a dozen of his meditations in my folder for this sermon. So I give you a paragraph or two, but an incredibly rich writer incredibly deep instruction for us as believers. This one's easier to understand. Rohr says, a common saying is, God helps those who help themselves. I think the phrase could be understood wisely, but in most spiritual situations, it's not completely true. Scripture clearly says in many ways, God helps those who trust in God, not those who help themselves. We need to be told that very strongly because of our do-it-yourself orientation. As educated people, as Americans, as middle-class people who have practiced climbing, we are accustomed to doing it 
ourselves, end quote. We are to be humble. We need to confess that we separate ourselves from other people, that we sometimes have that mentality of us and them, and we are on the outside and the other, we are on the inside and others are on the outside. And this comes from my reading up this week. Humility says that every person can teach me something about God and that every person can teach me something about myself. God's love breaks down those barriers. What does that look like for you and for me? I think first and most simply put is we look at the life of Jesus. Jesus as a humble servant coming to us, making God's love real for us. Who did Jesus reach out to? The people who were on the margins, the people who were not socially acceptable, not part of the in crowd, the people who needed what he had to give and could receive what he had to give. Jesus also talked about his role and ours. Jesus says in Luke 22, 27, who is more important, the one serving or the one sitting at the table being served? Everyone thinks it's the one being served, right? But I have been with you as the one who serves. A week or so ago, Vicki and I went to Cracker Barrel one evening, an impromptu dining out, and we met this most delightful rising star, which means brand new waitress, named Holly. And Holly was delightful. And we've talked about Holly since that time. And we really struck up more than a conversation. These were holy moments between Holly and us. And we realized at the end of that meal, she wasn't serving food, she was serving people. And she was sharing God's love and we were giving it right back. It was a delightful experience. Every time we go out to eat, we have that opportunity to connect with another child of God. Not a minimum wage person that I'll never get to know, but to say God loves them as much as God loves me. Let's connect. There is something in the way we're created that makes us want to connect. And humility is the key that unlocks that. Love makes that happen. So that's part of what it looks like today. The willingness to enter into another person's life, another person's suffering. I'll close with this story. Uh, you may have seen this online. Uh, I saw it on Facebook. It's been on other websites. Uh, it happened in Miami, Florida. A mother from Miami was so desperate to feed her hungry family that she was stealing a lot of food. Another woman, Miami-Dade County Police Officer Vicki Thomas, was about to arrest Jessica Robles, but changed her mind at the last minute. Instead of arresting her, she brought, bought Robles $100 worth of groceries. Quote, I made the decision to buy her some groceries because arresting her wasn't going to solve the problem with her children being hungry. And there's no denying they were hungry. Robles' 12-year-old daughter started crying when she told the local TV station about how dire their situation was, quoting her. It's not fun to see my brother in the dirt, hungry, asking for food, and we have to tell him there's nothing here. Officer Thomas says she has no question that she did what was right. To see them go through the bags that we brought them, it was like Christmas. That $100 to me was worth it. But Officer Thomas did have one request. The only thing I asked of her is when she gets on her feet that she would help someone else out. And she said she would. And guess what? The story gets better. After word got out about what happened, people donated another $700 for Jessica Robles to spend at the grocery store. Then best of all, a business owner invited her in for an interview and ended up hiring her on the spot as a customer service representative. She started crying when he told her, there's no words to say how grateful I am that you took your time and helped someone out, especially someone like me. And to think it all started with one veteran police officer 
trusting her instinct rather than going by the book. That's the story. And I'm wondering what would our instinct be? Humility, a willingness to enter into another person's suffering. That's what made the difference in this story. The mother deserved to go to jail, and the mother and her children deserved to have food to eat. Friends, you and I, we're the servants in our neighborhood. What eyes, what filters will we use in looking at those people around us? Will we look at someone and say, what do you need? How can I help? What ministry can we join in together to serve? It's important that we're watching and that we're listening and finding ways that we can be God's loving presence in the lives of everyone we meet. We meet God in the middle of those encounters. God is not aloof. God is not a spectator. God is in the midst of them. And we get our greatest joy in life when we're in that too, meeting God in that other person, sharing love, receiving love, called to be humble. God's life-changing love flowing through us. Share the love, save a life, change the world. Let's pray. God, your word is clear and powerful, and we pray that it does change us this day. Help us to look differently at those around us. Help us to be humble in all of our days, lifting others, grateful for the gifts that you send to them and through them. Help us to love your creation as much as you do, O oh God. We thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.